Let me say good evening to everyone and welcome to our study session. As it's Homo from CNA will say, let's get to it. Now I want to sort of um, play some dots together so that we are clear on how things are being linked and we get an overall understanding and perspective of the full picture and the drama that is unfolding before us. I think that is very, very necessary because we are dealing with a book that has a lot of symbolism. We have a variety of interpretations. And so we have to make sure that we are getting a, a clear understanding of where we are going. And we are also looking at a number of references which will, will tie in to helping us to understand the drama. And even with mature Bible scholars and readers, we often get difficulty in, in Revelation because it's not an easy book to comprehend. So we have to take it slowly. We have to recap often. And we have to try to tie things together that we have a clear understanding how the pieces of the puzzle are fitted together so that we get a good understanding and we're as much as possible trying to get the truth of what it is revealing to us. So, so far, we have looked at John's interpretation of the Bible Christ because this is what we are focusing on because we are examining the concept of the beast in Revelation and how that particular prophecy is interpreted, understood. So we recognize that it is important to, to go to New Testament scriptures which have a, a clear perspective that help us to understand figurative language because we identify that as one of the important principles in dealing with the scripture. Use clear passages to help us understand passages that are more difficult. And where possible, we use New Testament references to help us to understand the Old Testament because they, they are connected. So we looked at John's passages and reference the Antichrist and we got an understanding of how he viewed the concept of the Antichrist. Bear in mind that the same John who wrote the epistle is, is the same John who is recording the vision in Revelation. So he will be giving us some insight as to how he views um, that Christ. So we have identified some symbols which are very much connected to understanding the concept of, of the beast and the interpretations connected to it. So we look at, so far, the concept of the beast, and we recognize that we have two beasts identified in Revelation chapter 13. And one beast is associated with the Antichrist, the other beast is associated with the false prophet. That's according to the premillennial perspective in interpretation, in interpreting that passage of scripture from Revelation. We have the dragon, and last week, we looked at the, the concept of the, of the woman, the symbol of the woman that was introduced to us in chapter 17. And we then looked at chapter 12, which was where we first saw the concept of the woman. So if I identify the dragon, and this is related to the, the serpent, the devil, as the Bible has described it in, in chapter 12. Look at the beast. We look at the false prophet. We also recognize that there is a link between the prophecies in Daniel and those in Revelation relating the same concept of understanding the beast. So we look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 8, which gave us a historical perspective of kingdoms that would arise and in chapter 2 Daniel 
had the image of Nebuchadnezzar, which he would have interpreted. And we saw the four kingdoms being identified in, in that vision. A reference was made in particular to the last kingdom, of course, the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire in, in that order. And then in chapter 7, he also gave a description of those kingdoms in the same order, giving us a little more detail and using different symbolism. And in chapter 8, he also identified some of those kingdoms, not, not all of them. But it was important to recognize that the same description that Daniel gave of the fourth kingdom, which is the Roman Empire, matches the same description that is given in the book of Revelation. That is the kingdom with 10 horns or the kingdom with 10 toes, as he identified, and seven heads. So we have a comparison between Daniel and Revelation. So that helps us in understanding and interpreting the symbols because according to Daniel, they represented kingdoms. So the beast represented a kingdom in Daniel, and therefore we have to look at it as representing a kingdom in, in Revelation. It could mean a political or it could mean a religious kingdom because they're interconnected. We also examine different perspectives in terms of time interpretation from the book of Revelation. And that is very important because the different theological perspectives are going to be connected to how people view the, the timing of the prophecy. So there is a group of theologians referred to as the preterists who view the revelation given to John as connected to a past event. And for them, it is very much connected to children of Israel and what they experienced. So all the revelation according to their position would be connected to the past. So they are going to interpret it in that light. So how they examine the symbols and the interpretation that they ascribe to these symbols is going to be connected to the fact that they see the vision as connected to the past. And we look at that in our study and we saw how they applied the symbols to the past. So they saw Israel as a representation of the woman in chapter 12. But then that woman became the apostate harlot in chapter 17. And it matched very much with how Ezekiel and Jeremiah would have described Israel as an apostate nation that fell away from God. So those were the passages that you were saying to study, and we had a, a little discussion on them. And I hope you have taken the opportunity to go through them in, in, in really great detail because I don't know how you felt when you read them, but when I read those passages, it, it, it gives a sort of understanding of the, of the heart of God and what he would have felt as Israel moved away from him and worship other gods, other deities with interpaganism and apostasy and rejecting the God who was so loving to them as a husband, as he describes himself, and so you could understand how a husband feels when he has done his best for his wife and she forsakes him, turns to someone else. That is the feeling you got when you read those passages. And in spite of all of that, God was always reaching out to the children of Israel to, to bring them back to the place from which they have fallen. Even in, in, in Mark chapter 5, that was not a passage I gave you, but in Mark chapter 5, identified a number of things which God would have done in form of judgment to try to bring the children of Israel back in line. 
he said well, all that he did, he said famine, he said pestilences, he, he, he afflicted them with hardship, he caused difficulties in, in, in agriculture and, and, and problems in, in, in the way they were functioning. And he said, in all of that, they still refuse to turn. And then he said, prepare to meet your God. In other words, judgment is going to be coming. And so in the Old Testament, we saw prophetically judgment promised the children of Israel for forsaking God and turning to, to idolatry and to paganism. That is what we saw in the parables which Jesus gave. I reminded them of how he sent the prophets and they rejected the prophets. He came himself as the son of God. They rejected him and crucified him. And they are going to have to bear the punishment for the blood that was shed um, from the prophets and, and his own blood that was shed. And so when we look at Matthew chapter 24, we saw a fulfillment of the judgment that came on the Jews as a result of the rejection of God. So, so the people who are preterists then see revelation in that light. So what, what they would argue is that revelation is just an agreement of what Jesus would have prophesied in Matthew chapter 24. And all of revelation is connected to the Israel falling away and the judgment that came on them, the destruction of the city in AD 70, destruction of Jerusalem, and now the transfer of God's purpose from, from Old Testament Israel the New Covenant Church in the New Testament. So they saw the New Jerusalem or the Holy City coming down as that transfer of purpose from the Old City, Jerusalem, and Old Covenant to the New Covenant, which is established in the Church. So they would agree with what Peter says, that we are now the chosen generation, the royal priesthood, Purely people that we will show forth the praises of him who falls out of darkness in his marvelous life. So that's their position. So they are referred to as the preterists. They see it as all past. Those events have already taken place. Israel was judged, and, and God has established a new covenant in the church. And, and that's the church age that we are now operating in the kingdom of God established in, in, the, in the church age. And they would correspond that with what Daniel saw when the little stone that was cut out struck the image which was the Roman Empire and broke it into pieces and that little stone spread and became a large mountain. So they see that as the church, the New Testament church, which would have been established by Christ. That theological perspective seemed reasonable and, and seems very understandable and you, you could agree in, in part with how they interpret it but what they were saying then is that nothing in revelations really connect to the future so there's another group now that will say no we don't agree with that that's the futurist they see now all of revelation basically connecting to the future what john recorded in the vision, it's still to come to pass. That's the premillennial group now, who will see now the beast as the Antichrist who is to come in the future. He's to come out of the old Roman Empire that we revived, so still the connection to Rome, pagan Rome, revived, because Rome disintegrated and was broken down into to Europe. And what they see is that those European countries will be reconnected and establish themselves as a political union, and that the Antichrist would emerge out of that union. He will have worldwide power. He would have uh, an agreement and a covenant with the Jews in the first half of his reign. In the second half of his reign, he would turn against the Jews, and he would join with other Gentile nations and fight against the Jews in the so-called Battle of Armageddon. And Christ will return to bring an end to this power or the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself, and establish his millennial kingdom for a thousand years. So they see all of Revelation describing those events to unfold in the future. Of 
according to their theology, then the Antichrist would appear after the rapture. Because God will take the Christians out of the world. And, and, and according to their theology, the Holy Spirit also goes. And that's why chaos will break out in the world. And, and the Antichrist will try to bring some, some peace and harmony to what is, is going on. So during the seven years of tribulation, God is supposed to be pouring out judgment on, on, the, on the earth, on the Jews during that period of time. So that's their theological perspective. So they will interpret Revelation then this on that position that all of it is the future. Then there's a third position which we identified, which we call the, the, the historicist or the historical perspective, which sees Revelation as sort of synopsis of the, of the history of the church from the establishment of the kingdom of Christ right until he returns. And in that, Jesus is revealing to John the apostasy that will take place in the church, persecution that the church will undergo, but in the end, the church will be triumphant. The church will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony. And all that it goes through, what John sees is a victory that has been promised for saints, a shrine of the eternal kingdom, and the destruction of all opposing forces. So in that particular perspective, we do not see a secret rapture. If indeed John is identifying tribulation that the that world will go through, the belief is from the historicist is that the church will go through that tribulation. And when Christ returns, he brings an end to all things, all kingdoms, all powers. And he establishes eternal um, consummate kingdom where we are ushered in. We are taken from this earth to live with him eternally in the place that he has gone to prepare for us. So the amillennialists will fall basically into that group. And so our theologians will have a different interpretation, therefore, of this whole concept of the beast. And Revelation 13 and 17 and Revelation 12 so we are going to see the woman in a different perspective. And that is what we would look at tonight because we would have already looked at the first two. Those were the extreme ones. The, the one that looked at Revelation as just the past. The one that looked at Revelation as just the future. And then there's the, the middle group that sees the Revelation as, as a trace of the history. So it would involve past, present, future. So, so, so John gives a, a sort of panoramic view of what the church will encounter over, over time. We look at time references that were identified in Revelation, and we look at the very beginning, which we call the, epi the, the prologue, where it was mentioned that things will shortly come to pass, or the things are, are close at hand. And then even in the ending chapters of Revelation, they've mentioned also of things being close at hand. So from that, we conclude that some of the things John would have been seeing would have been things that would have been close to his time. But chapter 1 also mentioned things that will happen hereafter. It says things that are at hand, things that will happen hereafter. It said John, but the things that you have seen, the things that are, and the things that will happen hereafter. So that's why the, the historicist would have that perspective that is dealing with some past events, some events that were close to the future of John, and some events that will be further down in, in, in the future. So the Church of God theologians, who basically will fall into the amillennial group, will then be considered a seeing revelation from the historical perspective. And therefore, the interpretation of the beast, of the dragon, of the woman, 
would be different from the other two interpretations that we have seen. There might be some connections that you will see, but overall, they, they have a, a more spiritual um, implication from what we see coming out in the interpretation of the beast in Revelation 13. And the woman that we think of apostasy in chapter 17 and chapter 12 in the beginning stages. So what we're going to do now then is to tie those chapters together and see how we have the historical perspective and how the symbols would apply and what meaning we can gather. And then we can see how that compares with the other two. So if we pick up from chapter 12, This is where the woman is described. In her pristine glory. And last week when they asked the question, so how we will interpret that, we had two different positions. One saw the woman as, as Israel. And I think it was Brother Johnson that saw the woman as a representation of the church. And we said according to the symbolism used, you could see the application could fit both. Our theologians are inclined to have the second application of, of the, the woman representing the church. So they will see the church in her pristine glory as the woman clothed with the moon Clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head are come of 12 stars. Those 12 stars will be sort of representative of, of the 12 apostles. And the woman will represent the church rather than representing Israel. And so the, the man child will not be a literal child or will not represent Jesus as would have been seen by the, the, the historicists, sorry, by the preterists. But that child will represent the birth of the church and the establishment of the kingdom of God. The little stone that struck the image and became a great mountain. This is the start of that kingdom. The establishment of the kingdom of Christ represented by the 12 disciples. But Jesus was called the 12 disciples and he would have taught them. And that was the establishment of, of the, the kingdom of, of, of God. So those 12 um, stars will represent the 12 disciples, so the woman really represents the church. Now, as soon as the church is established, we saw in verse 3 that there appeared a one in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Watch the symbolism there again. This is again connected to the woman in power. So the church is going to be persecuted at, at the very onset of its establishment. And that's a historical fact. By the time the church was established, Rome sought to, to destroy the church. And this is representative of, of, of the, the red dragon here, which is, in, in essence, the symbolism of the Roman Empire being controlled by the devil. Because a little further down in, chapter, in verse 9, it says that the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. So, so the dragon, yes, they identified as Satan. Remember, Satan uses people, and he uses kingdom powers to accomplish his purpose. So the, so the dragon is using pagan Rome, represented by the seven heads and the, and the ten horns. And as Brother Randy suggested, the seven heads represented seven forms of government. Ten horns represented ten different kingdoms or ten different provinces that made up the Roman the Roman Empire. So we could see the connection to the Roman Empire, and we could then understand how the interpretation could be appropriate. Yes, even as Israel, we saw the appropriateness of that interpretation. As I said last week, we could see it in a, in a dual prophetic way because remember that that Israel became. The spiritual Israel in the church. 
so we can see the connection and the representative of both. And in the same way that, that literal Israel went into apostasy and fell away from God, the description of the woman who is sitting on the beast, who is described as the whore or the harlot or the prostitute, who is encouraging other people to be involved in her fornication and her idolatrous practices, what our theologians will interpret that as now is that the church also went into apostasy and fell away from the pristine glory that was established in the first century New Testament church. So you can see the parallel. Israel and with the church, because there is, there is harmony between Israel and the church, which is considered and described as called a spiritual Israel. So we are still the, the seed of Abraham spiritually by faith as the church. So we can see the appropriateness of, of the interpretation of the woman as the church in first time glory. And in chapter 17, she becomes the, the harlot and she falls away. And this is part of the persecution that on the way with Rome. And then they establish a connection with the same Roman Empire, and what we will see is that the dragon gave its power to the beast, and Satan passed on his influence to the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire passed on its influence to the beast. So the beast is going to represent for our theologians now an apostate church which is headed by a poor. So the Roman Empire gave its power to the beast, which has become a apostate church, which has fallen away from the original glory that it had. So we can see how it is comparatively connected. The spiritual Israel, which we saw, fell away into apostasy and was judged. The church. Sun and the moon and the stars in their pristine glory established by Christ and his 12 disciples was persecuted by the Romans. And as I said, the church went into the wilderness. And we're going to see how that wilderness experience is connected to the, the, the same papal experience that is described in Revelation chapter. 13 and Revelation chapter 17. What we would need to, to look at is to see how the symbols now are connected to this concept or this, this description which we have. Because if you're going to use the symbols, they, they, they must have a connection. And we said with, with Animal Farm, the animals represented something. And we, we have to look at what the symbols represent and we then get a, a deeper understanding of how the, the, the picture is unfolded before us. Now, just like to understand Animal Farm, you, you will have to have an understanding of, of the communist system and the practices to understand how the symbols used in Revelation of the beast and the, and the harlot woman be connected to the church going through apostasy. You have to have a little understanding of historical events so you will know how they are, are connected. So we have to look at the, at the character of the beast again and then we will see how this could be fulfilled in the representation of the papacy which is Roman Catholicism headed by, by the Pope and how that will be connected to the description that we have in Revelation chapter 13. So let's look at the description, the character of the beast. Beast rises out of the sea. This is chapter 13. It is a composite of the four beasts in Daniel. So we see the connection. So we are saying that there are elements, but we're looking at a spiritual application to this. We're not looking at, at the beast as a literal um, person as such, but a, a system controlled by a head. So the dragon gives its power and authority 
to the beast. The beast receives a deadly wound, and that deadly wound is healed. And some person asks a question um, in relation to that, that sweet which I told him we would, we would get back to, and how the application will be made in relation to that. It is a strong political power. It is a strong religious power. It is guilty of blasphemy. It was in, 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 in conflict with the saints. And it ruled for 42 months. And then it had this mysterious number of 666. That is what people seem to be most interested in. So that was a description of, of the, the beast in chapter 13, which is connected to the Antichrist, which is connected to the papacy, and which is connected to Nero. It depends on which theological school you are operating in. If you are of the preterist view, which is a, that it's a past event, you will say that that beast system is connected to Nero and his persecution of the Christians. If you are a futurist, like the premillennialist, you will interpret the beast as the Antichrist who is going to come in the future, who is going to persecute the children of Israel in the second three and a half years of his reign. If you are from the historical perspective, and you are in the amillennial group, and that's the, the, the theological school that we would find ourselves in, we would be inclined to interpret the beast as the papacy, which is falling away from the Roman imperial system into a religious system and that the emperor of Rome gave power to that system to function and operate as a worldwide power. And that power became a, a religious entity which was referred to as, as Roman Catholicism or the Roman Catholic Church headed by the Pope. What we need to do is to see how these characteristics will match up with, with the poor and the identity that we have. So the dragon represents pagan Rome, and pagan Rome gives its authority to the beast. Now, this is a statement here written by a professor of history, of Roman history. He said, to the succession of Caesars came the succession of the pontiff in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave a seat to the pontiff. Now, that's a term that is used for the Pope, the pontiff. And, and that term has come from, again, from the Roman Empire, because the emperors were referred to as the pontifex maximus. That's a Latin term. So... That's why you will often hear the Pope refer to as the pontiff. That's a term that was used to refer to the Roman emperors. So we see the connection here in that the, the beast got its power from the Roman Empire. And historically, that is precisely what happened. In Stanley's history, page 40, it says the Pope filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome inheriting their power, prestige, and titles from paganism. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting prone upon its grave. So historically, they are seeing that the Roman Empire transferred its power um, from imperial political power into church or ecclesiastical power headed by the Pope. And that took place in 4, 538 AD. That is when the first Pope took the reins of office and headed the, the Roman Empire, which again would have been falling apart. And, and so remember Constantine, his effort to, to try to unite the kingdom is, is giving more power and authority to the church through um, the papacy. 
we will see a little more about that and the connections that we have when we try to answer a question which was asked last week, which we were hoping we get some time in this session to look at. Do we still have the Babylon system and the Roman pagan system existing in the church today? Because bear in mind that the woman that was writing on the beast is described as mystery Babylon. And remember that the beast was described as having connections to the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Babylonian Empire, and the Medo Persian Empire. And, and the, the, the chief of those empires would have been the Babylon Empire. I remember when Daniel was, was writing, he was writing under that empire. So he, he knew what it was like because he faced the same sort of pressure to conform. In other words, he faced the pressure to take the mark of, of, or the image of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar set up a very big image and people were expected to bow down and, to, and worship this image. And Daniel and the other Hebrews that were brought from Judah refused to bow. So in the, in the same light, they're going to see the same pressure that's going to be put on, on the Christians to, to bow down to papal Rome and to, and to worship the image which has been established. So the, the beast is going to be of a worldwide power because Revelation 13, it says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. So we saw that the Roman church had worldwide power. It became a universal power. Roman Catholicism was established as a worldwide power. Then he was speaking with a mouth of blasphemy, meaning that the, the Pope would be a person who speaks with blasphemy, if we're going to use the symbol to represent the Pope, that is what would happen, because he's such a person. The Pope's claim to be the vicar of the Son of God. So, so remember in John's description, he said the Antichrist is one who, who stands in place of Christ. Not just one who opposes Christ, but he stands in place of, and the, and the Pope's said they were God's representative on earth and they were standing in place of Christ. And as a matter of fact, the inscription which the Pope carried on his mitre, remember I told you that, that the mitre is connected to, to the headpiece that the Babylonian um, rulers would have used. So the Pope wore the same type of mitre, but he had a Latin inscription on it. English was that he was called the vicar of the Son of God, but the Latin was vicarious filii dei. Don't worry too much about, about the Latin inscription. The significance of that is that the Latin inscription, when you use the Roman numerals, because remember the Romans had um, numbers attached to, to, to their, their, their letters, which carried a certain numerical value that B was five and I was one and such like. So when you wrote down the inscription on the on the Pope's mitre, with the Roman numerals it added up to six six six. And that's where people would have seen the connection. And that's why the Reformation leaders, most of them basically some of the early church fathers, they interpreted Revelation from a historical perspective and they saw the beast represent, representing the papal system that would become, would become a worldwide religious power established on the earth. And the claims that the Pope made obviously would give them the inclination that he would be representing what Daniel saw in, in that vision. He was given a most speaking blasphemies. He was a persecuting power. Revelation 13, 7 says, it was granted unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Uh, I would have previously mentioned to you the, the papacy was involved 
seriously in the persecution of, of, of Christians, especially of the Protestant Christians. And so people who fail to abide by, by their teachings and subscribe to their traditions on the way serious persecutions. Now, a lot of people are ascribing the mark 666. And yes, I can see the appropriateness of it when you look at the Latin inscription and whatnot. But I don't, I don't think that the emphasis really is on, on a literal mark. I think it's supposed to be a symbolic representation because it's indicated to you, Revelation also speaks about a, a mark or identification which the Christians will have on their foreheads. It's a seal given to them by God, and we do not see it as a literal mark. So therefore, you know, we, we need not see that 666 as a literal mark which people will have on their forehead or on their hands. The people who are of the futurist perspective, the premillennialists who see the beast as the Antichrist, they believe that that is going to be a literal mark because they are inclined to interpret Revelation literally. A lot of the symbols, they are inclined to have a literal perspective. Whereas the historicists see Revelation as having a spiritual implication or application. And so they, they are inclined to see things in, in a more spiritual way. So, so, the, so the mark then of the beast will be things that identify you with that particular system and that particular practice and those particular traditions and those particular belief systems. And so people who fail to identify with them are persecuted. As a matter of fact, there were, there were thousands of, of Christians that were martyred under the, the reign of, of, of the papacy. As a matter of fact, there was one queen, Queen Mary, they call her Bloody Mary. I think she was responsible for the, the, the martyrdom of, of over 200 um, Christian saints alone. And she was the Roman Catholic queen. So, so there's the application again to the beast as, as the Roman Catholic system headed by the poor. One, they had global power. One, they were given the, the authority from the, the, the Roman system and the Roman empire. The, the, the Pope spoke in, in words of, of blasphemy, identifying himself as the vicar of the Son of God. And not only that, the Pope also claimed to have the power to forgive sin. And that's why you still have, even up to today, people going and making confessions to the poor because they established themselves as, as having the power and that God gave them the power as, as his representative on earth to be able to, for, to forgive sin. No, no, that's blasphemy. Because if you go back to the New Testament, when the Jews accuse Jesus of blasphemy, these are the very two things that are identified with the papacy or with the papal system. One, claiming to have the power to forgive sin. That's what Jesus did. And he, he had the power because he was God. And then the, the, the way he spoke as he represented God, he was the son of God, he was the image of God, he was God himself. And that is what he was crucified for. Because the Jew says he's blasphemous. How can he be a man claiming to be God? How can he, a man, have the power to forgive sins? Blasphemy. And that's what Revelation is pointing out when it's saying he was speaking with the mouth of blasphemy. That's what the Pope basically represented in, in, in the way they function and operated. Also, if you look at the concept of purgatory, the Pope believed that they have the power. To, to pray people out of, of, of purgatory. And purgatory is a place where you will go as an intermediary between heaven and hell. So if you were not too evil, you would go into this, this, this place of mediation and that uh, you will have a chance in purgatory to be redeemed and, and, and get to heaven even though you departed from this world as a sinner. And the Pope believed that they had the power to pray people out of purgatory and as a matter of fact, they made people pay during that, that, um, the Middle Ages. They made people pay to, to be prayed for that depart, they departed loved ones to get out of purgatory and still be able to enter into heaven. So you can see how blasphemous that was. So you see the, the application would fit there. Then it says that he would continue for 1260 years. And we say that prophetically, um, it says, um, 42 months or 
time, times, and half a time, as Daniel said. So we see the harmony in the time references used in, in Daniel and in Revelation. And remember, if you look back at chapter 12, you will see that the woman, when she was being persecuted by the, the, the dragon, she went into the wilderness for 1260 days. And it said that the Lord preserved her there and kept her in that period of time. So how do our theologians see that? How do the historicists see that? This is the period which is represented by the reign of papacy, which would have started, as I said, in 538 AD, when the first pope was established in, in, in position. Power passed on from Emperor Justinian to the first pope. And then in 1798, that was where the, the pope reigning at that time was taken captive by Napoleon's general and the, and the papal reign and supremacy which they had was brought to an end. Started in 538, ended in 1798. But remember that it will be revived. It will have a deadly wound, as indicated in, in the illustration in, in Revelation, but it will be revived. And yes, we can see a revival of the papal system in our present age. So it, it was power was, was brought to an end when Napoleon um, captured the, the Pope and imprisoned him. And as a matter of fact, he died in, in, in exile. And people thought that that was the end of the Roman Catholic system and the end of the papacy. But we can see it has revived because the papacy is still um, active and present as today. It, it still has global influence. And the Pope still exercised a fair amount of power and authority. And he has gained a lot of respect from kings and, and leaders across the world. Um, during the Middle Ages and up to this present time, the Pope still has that sort of influence. So we can see how the connection there to the revival of, of, of that um, period could be seen. So the, here's another application of the symbol. So the 1260 um, years represent that period where the paper system was in full authority and full reign, and it works out to basically exactly um, 1260 years. So, so in a nutshell, then that, that is how the symbolism will apply. And I, I think that that is a, a reasonable interpretation. I think it's a pretty sound interpretation. I think it's, it's, it's the symbols would match very well in terms of the interpretation. But remember, we said we have three different interpretations based on three different systems, and, and all of them would appear to be, to be sound. So we, we can't say basically that somebody is wrong in their interpretation. What we can look at and see how will the applications be appropriate and to what extent we can see a reality in them and how they could apply. To, 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 to what we understand from our study of the word and from the study of history that we can make um, these applications. Now, the one that's significant here and that we must come to understand is that the, the truth of these interpretations will also be connected to something that is very, very significant and over which there has been a lot of debate. When was the book of Revelation actually written? That is very, very important. And there are two major positions on this. And um, basically, each of the, 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 the two different schools of thought present some very sound arguments for the, the, the time period of, of the writing of the book. One particular group believes that Revelation was written when John was younger, that is about in the 60s, because he would have written before Nero died, and Nero would have died in AD 68. So John would have written before Nero died if, if the interpretation that is given by the preterists can be applied, meaning that it's of, of past events in, this, in the describing what happened to, to, 
to Israel and the destruction of the city in AD 70, they are arguing that John was seeing that in the vision. Obviously, if he's seeing that in the vision and there's prophecy, he would have had to, to write the prophecy before Nero would have passed away and before the city was destroyed in AD 70. Because they see the beast as Nero. And I showed you last week how they apply the symbolism to Nero. And it sounds reasonably um, justifiable. But, but the important thing here would be now, if Revelation is written later, like the other group of theologians argue, and they believe that they have evidence for that because of the, the early church fathers are more inclined to believe that it was written late. And our church of God theologians form, form into that group who are more inclined to believe that Revelation was written when John was older, that is about 90 plus. They believe that Revelation was written about AD 95. But if that is accurate and, and all the records and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the data points to the fact that Revelation was written around AD 95, then it would mean that the preterist view would have issues because it then could not be prophecy because John will be writing long after the destruction of, of Jerusalem, which took place in AD 70. Nero would already have died. So their, their particular position would have an issue in terms of their interpretation. So while it looks sound when you look at the symbols, that's what I'm saying, we need to have history, we need to have an understanding of certain things when we are are trying to interpret the word because history and events are very, very much important in, in understanding the connections and relationships. Now, if it was written at that time, the interpretation of the future Antichrist could be possible, and the interpretation of the beast as the papacy could also be possible because of the time in which they would occur. So you can see where the pressures you will have difficulty if John is written early, sorry, if John is written late. But, but again, those are issues that are debated and, and a lot of people who study the information say that the argument seems sound for both cases that was written early and it's written late. While most theologians tend to, go to, to believe that it was written late, and it seems that, that most of the evidence that have come forth seems to more side with the late writing. So if that is the case, our particular view will, will, will have a justifiable position because it will fit in to the time reference. So these are a whole lot of things that we, we have to, to, to understand and grapple with when we are trying to interpret um, the book of Revelation. So now we have all three positions. Preterist view, the historicist view, and the futurist view. We have the amillennial view, and I should say that a lot of the post-millennial will be inclined to interpret the revelation as, as past. And then we have the amillennialist, which will be inclined to interpret revelation as history being traced. So yes, John would have seen the beast representing the papacy because the papacy will not have been established yet. But John indicated that the Antichrist spirit was already present. And when we read 2 Thessalonians, because that's another passage that we, we, we have to, to, to look at, we have not examined in any great detail, but just to hint at that, because that's a passage that the premillennialists use to support their view that the Antichrist is still to come. He is still a future personality to be revealed in, on the scene sometime in the future. But we, we cannot at least put a time into that because according to their tradition, it will only occur after the rapture. And we have discussed the rapture. We do not see that as an event that has been predicted in the Bible or indicated in the Bible. So if that is to have uh, any credence, 
it will have to take place, yes, during the tribulation period, but the Christians will still have to be here. And, and then it is it's going to put their whole theological perspective um, out, of, out of alignment. That's how, how they will see it. So I'm going to pause there and see if anybody wants to make any comments on those different positions and see if they are reasonable options. And we will have perhaps already made comments in relation to the first two. So if you want to make any comments in relation to the third one, which I looked at tonight, which is one that our church theologians support, and which I said the early reformers supported. I talk about people like Luther and Calvin and Wycliffe and Zwingli and, and um, Whitfield, the early reformers, and then Augustine and the early church fathers. They, they interpreted Revelation in that particular light, that the beast will represent the papacy, and, and that would have been, then John wrote, obviously it would have been a future event, but the signs were already there, because Paul, Paul said, the mystery of iniquity that already worked. Only he who no letteth be let until he be taken out of the way. That's a verse that caused a lot of debate. The premillennials believe that the he who now letteth will let on he until he be taken out of the way. They believe that that refers to the Holy Spirit. That when the church goes in the rapture, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the, the world. So, so it's the Holy Spirit that is now keeping the, the Antichrist from being revealed. We will have issue with that because if Paul says that he who now letteth, the word letteth means he who now restrains or he who now keeps in check, it's keeping him in check until it means that the hope that that, that power be keeping him in check for a long time. And how will he be kept in check if he is not yet manifested? So the possibility is that Paul could be speaking about something different. Our theologians believe that he was speaking about the papacy and the rise of the Pope, and that the restraining power was not the Holy Spirit. But the power that was keeping him from being manifested was the Roman Empire that was still active. When that Roman Empire was broken down and destroyed and disintegrated, and the power is now transferred to the Pope, that's when he came in to power. So the key who now let it, they will refer that to the Roman Empire. It's the Roman Empire that is keeping the, um, the Antichrist which is the representative of, of the papacy in check. And, and a very key point also to be made in that passage, second Thessalonians chapter five, is that Paul said to the Thessalonians, you know, you know that person, you know who is keeping or who is restraining that individual. So if they know, it means that the reality will have to be a, a present reality. You know, we look at that in, in a little more um, detail when we examine passage. Okay, so as I said, I will pause for any comments or any questions, and then I will move on um, to look at the characteristics now of the, the Babylonian system still in place. Because remember, as Revelation 17 said, ancient Babylon was still present when John wrote and its power is still going to be in the future. It was, and is, and is to come. And if you look at that, spiritually speaking, yes, Babylon was born as a physical city, but the, in a spiritual sense, its traditions and part of its pagan, pagan culture was still being practiced in Rome. And then what would happen is that Rome would transfer that same sort of, of, of pagan practice and culture into the papacy. And, and we will see how, how that has occurred in the final part of our discussion and like in answer to the question that somebody asked last week, if we were going to look at the presence of Babylon, that system still in place in, in, the, in the church today and in what form. And I would open up for, for anybody who can, can say if they think that that is reality, that we still have elements of the pagan practice that came through Roman Catholicism still in the church today, 
you can you can say how. But after you make a comment or have a question on what we just discussed, looking at the beast being represented by the papacy and, and by the Pope. So it's not an individual, a single individual. But remember, John said there are many antichrists. So, so each Pope is a representative of, of, of that personality. So it's not a single individual, it's a system. Because remember, the beast represented a system. It's a religious system headed by a Pope or a pontiff who, under the Roman system, will be the emperor who headed the system. So I pause. I've said a lot. Yeah, yes, Rev, you have um, Randy. Randy has either a comment or a question. Yes. Yes, Randy. Question. Mm -hmm. Now, in Revelation 12, sorry, Revelation 12, 6, it says the woman went in the wilderness where she was nourished. My question is, when that happened, when yes. she went to the wilderness, um, is there any evidence to prove that the gospel was still being preached while the lady was in the wilderness, where the church was in the wilderness? Yes. All right, so, the, so the concept of the wilderness there meant that the gospel was in the way suppressed, but it was, it was not killed. Because remember, they said that she was preserved, she was fed, she was kept, so she was still being nurtured. So in other words, the, the, the gospel was still in people's heart. Remember that the kingdom, uh -huh. the kingdom of God is in people's heart. So, so while Rome was in power, Rome was persecuting Christians. There were Christians. So, so it's just that it could not be proclaimed um, as as it ought to have been to the world. There could not have been a, a public um, aff affirmation of it because it was being subdued. And anybody remember Paul. Um, not abiding by the traditions and the practices and the teachings of Rome, because remember, the, the papacy said that the Bible had to be interpreted through them. And mm -hmm. remember, it was written in Latin, and they had the authority, and only when it was translated in English could people read and understand for themselves. And that was something that came in the Reformation movement. So yes, the church was being preserved, but it's like in, in, in some countries now where the church is on the ground because there's persecution by, by, by um, different religious groups. But it's still existent. It's existent in people's heart and in people's lives and people's relationship. So yes, the church was in the wilderness, meaning that its power was subdued. It was in a, in a difficult place, but it was actually preserved. So so the church never died when okay. it was subdued. I have, yes. I have one more um, in Revelation chapter twenty, verse five. Yes. Then it says, then it says, and the rest of the dead. Live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first right. resurrection, the rest of the dead. How do we view that? Let me say the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Is this physical or is it right to refer to something spiritual? There is a spiritual application to that, even though even though there's some um amillennialists who believe that there could be a, a physical connection. But but we are going to, to discuss, as a matter of fact, we're going to be coming to that in our next study when we're looking at the kingdom of God, we're looking at this thousand year period and the symbolism of it. But, the, but remember, um, death can be looked at as spiritual and physical. Okay? Remember the Bible says that you have feet quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. He that have the son half life, but he that have not the son half not life. So you can be spiritually dead. And, 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 and so you can, you can come to life when you receive Christ in your life. So the church went through a, 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 a period where, as I said, the gospel was suppressed. Remember that that thousand year period represents the, the period of, of the church age. And, and, and the rest of the day, not living until the thousand years have expired, meaning that there were some people who were not received, did not receive Christ until that period of time had expired. So it remained spiritually dead. And, and after that period of time, they were able to receive Christ. Some people look at it as, as the period of time during which the papacy subdued um, the spread of, 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 of the gospel. And, and that that was part of the, of the time period that the church would have been in existence. So that, that thousand year period would have included, remember the thousand year is not a, 
literal thousand year is an extended period. So part of that thousand year period would include the same paper reign from 538 to 1798 when um, the, the, the gospel was subdued and there were people who, who could not receive Christ because of the gospel not being published. And so after that period of time, then they were, they were able to, to receive the gospel and spiritually they were able to come to life. So the rest of the day, they not live until that period of time had expired. So those that were dead spiritually were able to come to life afterwards when they were able to receive the gospel after the Reformation and receive Christ. That's how it's, it's viewed in, in spiritual sense. But as I, as I indicated, when we come to look at the kingdom of God, which we will pick up in, in our next study, we will see how, how that can be more accurately and appropriately applied. All right, Rev. We also have something from um, Ian. Ian Innes. Any yes. question yeah. or comment? Hi, good evening, Reverend Jackman. Yes. Um, my, my question, or should they say comment, is basically connected to what you were saying in terms of if we are seeing evidence of the power of Rome and the Pope and all of that here in our timeline as we are living. I was okay. wondering if there is any connection to the Roman power that they've had down through the years and then the, 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 those movements like the Masons and the Masonic Lodge and so on, if they're interconnected in any way and if it has anything to do with what we're discussing in terms of the Roman power and so on that they've had in terms of the papacy. Yes, there, there, there is a connection. Um, but I'll, I'll respond to that if there are no more questions or anybody doesn't have any other comments in it. And, and remember, as I indicated, if, if there are individuals who have done any studies on their own and, and they can see a, a connection of the pagan power that was passed on from Rome that would remember originally came from Babylon, that's where the connection is. Babylon transferred a lot of its cultures and its practices to pagan forms down through the empires and if they, they were infiltrated were right into Rome and then when Rome passed on its authority of power to the church um, to the, the, the Roman Catholic Church and we're not here to try to point fingers and condemn we're just dealing with truth what is reality and um, a lot of people don't like to talk about these things because they feel they're offensive but we, we are dealing with history and we're dealing with fact and, and we can see evidence so yes we can, we can see things that have been passed on. And we're going to mention some of them, even though we may not be able to go into them in, in, in detail. But if you want more information on them, sure, I can pick up on them in the next session before we actually go on to look at the kingdom of God. So, you know, I'll, I'll hold that. But yes, that, that question is relevant. All right, Rev, we also have um, Pastor Carton, Pastor Carton, and then Randy has another um, either question or comment. So, Pastor Carton, you, and then um, Randy. Yes, Pastor Carolyn. Yes, sir, brother. Um, Eddie, just to support you um, in the comment about the suppression of the gospel. Paul can can your volume you come up a little bit? I am I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it in a very faint way. I hope this is better. This is better? Yes. Okay. I'm just saying, um, Paul alludes to the same suppression of the gospel even in his time, both in his letter to Ephesians 6.19 and Colossians 4.3. Paul asks that the saints pray for him that he may be able to give utterance as he ought to. And so that even in Paul's time on in Europe, there was suppression of the gospel. All right, I, I, missed, I missed the end of that. Jeff? Well, yes. Jeff? Yes, sir, you get a, a clear, you get a clear volume because my volume went down. I yeah, didn't hear I, the ending of. Oh. Right. So, so what um, Pastor Carter was saying is that Paul alludes to such in both Ephesians six nineteen and Colossians six. Yes. yes. Um, he, he was alluding to. He said Paul was alluding to. The suppression of the gospel. Suppression of, precisely. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. 
Right. And we have Randy again coming in uh, with either a comment or question. Yes, Brother Randy. All right. Two, two, two observations and then a question. Now, you asked about elements. Now, did yes. you say in history that, you know, one, the Catholic, then you, you had the Anglicans, then you had the Methodist. Each person came out of each person. And then yes. there were a lot of things that the Catholic practice that right. other other people when they came out still held on to. And that yes. is why then when it when it came down to when you know we sing a song, the day of sex and creeds for us has ever more passed. When our mm -hmm. uh, reform and our the first the persons who started the church of God, they set out to pull the way from that and seek to establish the true church in holiness and righteousness as Christ was as established. But there are still today, I think there are still today, certain fragments of these things that you mentioned about that are still elements within the church. Yes. Now, my other question to you, now when the Bible talk about he who do not have the smart to sell and buy, do you know yeah. of the country in the world who has um uh, Randy brother yes. Randy hey, you're breaking up yeah oh, you you feedback. I didn't hear the end of it do you hear me better now yes yes yeah or do my question is when you when the Bible talk about someone who don't have this mark will not be able to sell or buy do you know of any country in the world that people have these implants that when they go to cash register or anything like that, they can do their business because of what has been injected into them? Do you know of any country? Um, I think they're saying that some of the countries in, 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 in Europe, I don't, I, I'm not sure. In terms, I was hearing Sweden or Switzerland, where there are people that already have um, digital implantations that they can go and it identifies them when they go to the airport or different places. But I, I don't know specifically, I've been hearing that. Yeah. But Reverend Jackman, Sweden. Yes. Sweden, Reverend Jackman. Sweden, Sweden, Reverend Jackman. Sweden, Sweden, okay. Right, so so some people recognize that as as as, as the mark. Um, some people look at barcode as the mark, but as I was indicating, it might not necessarily mean a literal mark that we are actually going to be dealing with. But we can see, yes, in, in form of how the world is going, that people are making a lot of implantations that make things easy to identify you, and not only that, it will give a, a sort of global um, access to a lot of information of, of um, people, about people, and you can see how it could uh, connect a world system and a world control. So that's why I, I was saying that while well, we're looking at the interpretations and we're trying to understand how they match and, and represent the symbols, we can't we can't rule out possibilities that yes, we could see a future global system. Um, who knows? Being again fueled by the, the Roman Catholic system. And in part, that's why you have to watch ecumenism and how the, the, the Roman Catholic are trying to pull the, the, the um, ecclesiastical powers back together as one, where they can exercise control. Those are things that you might need to watch. So, so, so yes, we can, we can see dual applications and, and future things can take place that would bear resemblance to what we are seeing in the final revelation. But as I said, we call it something in the future, and we do not have anything directly to connect it. So we'll have to wait for things to unfold to see if they are going to be applicable to, to the description that we would have been seeing in Revelation. Whereas with the, the other interpretations, we can we can have a historical perspective that can show us how the application can be made. But if we follow the premillennial view. Of, of this antichrist emerging and, and this mark that we have to take and they will not be able to be involved in business activity unless they have the mark. It might not necessarily be a literal mark, 
But again, remember, as I told you, you can have a system that if you don't follow its traditions and practices, which we identify as its mark, that you could be subdued, you could be in, in, in a way hindered from functioning or operating, and that could be something we see on full in, in a future world. But as I indicated, we would have to wait for it to happen because we don't have any markers indicated. But yes, that is happening in, in some countries where identifications are being implanted or systems or chips are being implanted, people that carry information that, that can identify those individuals. And it's limited now, but who knows it can become no, a global reality. Not crossing River Jackman, but yes. in our own country, I think there. The, the, they are to revamp our ID cars if, if you if I don't know if you heard about that. And your yes. ID cars will not in all of these um, top information about you now. Uh, and because I understand that they are trying to move to that too. It, it seems it seem that way. As, as I indicated, a lot of things are becoming very digital. And, and, and the world is going towards a place where they can, can simplify things um, and get away from a lot of a lot of paperwork and a lot of um, bureaucracy in, in, the, in the way things are done. And this digital world is, is going towards that way to simplify things. And, and as I said, some people see that as the mark of the beast. But remember the mark was 666. So I don't know how we can apply that. And the mark was a literal mark on your forehead or on your hand. And, 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 and that's the premillennial view. As I said, I will not throw that through the window. Whereas I don't believe that it's gonna be a literal mark. Yes, we can have a system that becomes prevalent in our world where people can be controlled, people can be monitored, and you cannot have the freedom to do certain things and function in certain ways unless you are part of the system. Because remember, this whole beast thing is a system, it's a power. It's not just an individual. Uh, we are in a, in, a, in a new world order system. And you listen to the to a lot of the United States presidents, they keep making mention of the new world order, the new world order. And, 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 and so it, it is a reality that we have to look at in the future that in a way could connect to some of the symbolism that is being used in Revelation. So as they say, while our theologians have a different perspective, I will not completely throw the, the preliminary view of seeing future personality, I will have a variance in terms of the timing because we do not support a secret rapture. Yes, there could be tribulation and uh, the church go through that tribulation. As a matter of fact, we have always been going through tribulation from the very beginning because we saw how the dragon uh, persecuted the woman and she had to go in the wilderness. So, so persecution was always there and it will continue right through the life of the church. I believe it will get greater because we're seeing how even religious groups, the Hindus and the Muslims, seriously persecuted Christians before it was a communist type of system. But now religious groups are turning against Christians and we're seeing um, government entities and, and, and those things beginning to operate in a way that, that show you that they are about population control. And, and yes, we can reach a stage where, where Christians could be even under pressure in light of the fact that there's a growing hatred and persecution for our Christians and what we stand for, because we have a different mark. We have the mark of the Holy Spirit. We have a different seed. And so there are two systems of written. There is the system of the beast, and there's the system of God. There is a spiritual identification which we have. We don't carry a literal mark. We identify with the Holy Spirit, and we are led and directed by the Holy Spirit and our fruit, we are witness to that spirit. But then there is a worldwide global system which are drawing people away from God and pulling them towards a system which represents a pagan anti-Christ or opposition to Christ and what God stands for. That's why they say that the, the, the evolutionary um, move is growing at a faster rate than even the church today. And that people who are turning to, to, to evolution is, 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 is going at a, a faster way than even Christianity. So we can see the move between these two worlds and, and these two kingdoms. But remember, the promise in Revelation is that, that the church will prevail. 
all these Canaans will become the Canaans of our God and of our Christ. He will reign forever and ever. So despite what we are facing, the challenges that we are facing, the church has been promised a triumph. All we have to do is whatever we go through, we will remain faithful. I remember in Revelation 18, it says, come out. Don't take the mark. Come out from that system. That's what Revelation um, 18 tells us, and that's what we must be able to answer as Christians. Don't allow that system that is that prevailed then and that will even be prevailing in our world to bring us under its power and its control. We separate ourselves from it. Don't be drawn back into paganism and pagan practices. All right, now I want to answer Ian's question because he raised one of the issues. Now, there are a number of them I have here in answer to the question, what is there about the church today that still shows signs of the pagan practices that were transferred from the, 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 the Roman Empire into the church, from the imperial system into the ecclesiastical system? And there are a number of them, and you'll be amazed and you'll be shocked to see how they all tie back to Babylon. Yes, Freemasonry started with Babylon. And that's why the woman was described as mystery Babylon. Because Babylon was associated with a lot of, of mysteries and, 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 and secret societies and, 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 and Gnosis, which, which they call wisdom. That's how you get Gnosticism. And that people were initiated into these orders according to how high a ranking you had. You, 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 you were given more gnosis or more knowledge or more understanding of the mysteries. And, and there were secrets that were revealed to the people who were higher. This is where you've got third degree and, and second degree masons. So the higher up you go in, in, in the secret societies, the more gnosis, the more information, the more mysteries are revealed, revealed to you. And according to the Babylonian system, way back then, if you broke or divulged any of those secrets, you were killed. So yes, Freemasonry, and you want to hold that in the church. There are Freemasons in the Catholic Church and there are Freemasons in the Anglican Church. So Freemasonry has, has, has also spread into the church and, and, and it is practiced in the church. And that was part of the Babylon system, which is still prevalent today. That's one. Then this whole concept of, of, of giving credence to female deities, that, that was part of the whole Babylonian movement. And it expressed itself in, in, in the worship of female deities. And they had different names according to the different cultures. In Egypt, you had Isis. In, 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 in Ephesus, you had Diana. Remember when Paul went to Ephesus to preach, he saw um, the temple and the shrines were making to the goddess Diana, seeing the queen mother of heaven. And that started from, from way back in Babylon with, with Semiramis, who was supposed to be Nimrod's wife, who gave birth to a son called Tammuz. And we, we see this from the scripture. And there was this um, female deity worship, mother and son worship, which came from Babylon and which emerged into Rome and which filtered into the church. I remember Constantine claimed to have an alliance with the Christians, but what he was trying to do is to merge Christianity and paganism that there were no um, schisms in, in the empire. So he, he gave freedom for paganism to be practiced and, and Christianity, but, but there was a merging so that there be, so be harmony. And, and the papacy uh, uh, allowed those traditions to become prevalent because they, they wanted to, to gain um, followers and, and, and therefore they allowed that system to come into place. So we still have it practiced now in the church where Mary represents the female deity. And, and yes, we would, we would say that we, that we give worship to Jesus, but you would, you would notice that, that, that Mary is the person that is, is recognized as the intercessor between their, their followers and, and God. So Mary intercedes. So you pray to Mary. The Bible says that Jesus is, is the intercessor between God and man, and there is no other intercessor. So, so, so Mary is elevated to the same place. She's she sort of deified 
any way that there were female deities that came from Babylon and went through even right into the, the Roman system. And then the, the, the whole concept, I'll just mention a few quickly that you can in, in, in get a, a flow because we discussed it in more detail. This whole concept of transubstantiation, where, where the, 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 the blood and body of Christ became become the, the actual body, the sacraments of the bread and the wine become the actual body of Christ, the body and the blood of Christ. And this happens from the prayer of the poor. This was something that was practiced way back in Babylon. The, the eating of, 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 of the meat and the flesh initiate you into God's status because that's how you identify with, with the pagan deities by using their, their meat and, 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 and drinking the, the, the blood and identify you with the pagan deities. And, and so in Rome, that practice came through in the Catholic Church and, 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 and it even still part of their worship. That's what we often say. Um, and I, I remember called, uh, Pastor Richard just often say that uh, we do not believe in transubstantiation. We do not believe that the bread is the body of Christ and the wine is the blood. And there was a reason for saying that because that is a theology that has come through the Catholic Church and, and it is really an element of, of pagan practice that was practiced from way back in Babylon. And, and, and that is another element that has remained in, 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 the, in, the, in the pagan church. So you can see how you understand the concept of the beast and, 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 the, and, the, and the Roman Catholic system in alignment because the Babylon culture came into practice in Rome and then it was transferred and adopted by the papal system. All right, and the other things that we would have to look at in terms of what Ezekiel and Jeremiah had indicated that were pagan practices that the Jews were involved in and that they have also still filtered into our system. I won't go into them now because we were called for study, right? But all this thing about the patron saints, so you can pray to patron saints. And you have saints for, for different things, like a saint for peace and a saint for war and a patron saint for love. Back to Rome again. The Roman pantheon had a number of gods for each thing that you can think about a god of love, a god of war, a god of agriculture, practice in the in the in the in the papal system. The concept of cardinals, where did that come from? Back from the old pagan system again. So there are a number of things. I don't think it's only in the Catholic Church, but as Randy indicated, Protestantism came out. Some of the Protestant churches came out of some of those same um. Catholic systems and still practice some of the things that, that, that would be identified with Roman Catholicism. And when it comes to the festivals that are observed, which we will look at, like the concept of, of Easter, where that came from, and the concept of Christmas, where that came from, because this would more now connect to evangelical groups and how they were connected um, to pagan systems, how they came into the church, and what form. They came into the church. Those are things that we will, we will look at um, in the next section. But it is very, very interesting to see how a lot of the paganism came through the church and is still part of our, of our world today. Not that we become sinful because of certain things, but what God has warned us is not, not to allow us to be caught up in, in traditions that are not really traditions that identify with what God have instructed us to identify with. So we hold, we hold that for, for next week because it would involve us in some study from, from the word and we can see how more of these things are appropriate to us. They are worship and where that came from and how we might still be seeing forms of it. Right, so five past nine, so I'll, I'll stop up there for next. So I know that much will get you very, very excited about next week because that will be introducing things that are now more relevant and more practical and more pertinent that we can actually see and um, identify with and understand. Uh, before you Thank you very much that, again for, much, yeah. for your involvement in, in the study. I look forward 
um, to next week. So we will try to finish off this section and then pick up and looking at the kingdom and things that are connected to understanding the kingdom of God. Present reality, future linear kingdom that we, we're now looking for. Go back to Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ryan has a question. Oh, question. Yes, okay. Pastor. Yes, Pastor Jackman. Um, I just want to yes. go about it for you, Rafael. Um, in terms of this mark, do you think that this mark, whether visible or not, in terms of, would you want? Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not hearing you. I'm getting a little feedback. So I know if Jeff, if your audio is better, you can can listen and then give me what the question is. Okay. Let's see if it any better. Yeah, the sound came a little better. Okay. Now, I was just asking, um, this mark that we spoke about, the mark of the beast, whether yes. this mark is visible or invisible, do you yes. think that it would be one of such that will have you guessing as to whether you would have received this mark or not? The reason why I'm asking is that it is placed on two not noticeable locations, your forehead or on your, or your arm. Yeah. Um, I believe that if you would have definitely received this mark, or you 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 should know. I don't know what you think about that. You know, we have all sorts of theories, even if the vaccination is part of the mark. So I don't know what was your feeling about that. Yeah, but you see, if, if you're if you're looking at it in a spiritual sense, you don't have to wonder if you have the mark or not. If you're looking at this, the mark as a as a spiritual identification, right? We know. God's spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his. Mm -hmm. So we know that we have a connection. And if we have, the, if we have that mark, we have that seed, we have that identification, we know that we belong to Christ. And we know that we are not practicing the things that will identify us with the spiritual mark of that system which opposes God and, 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 and which wants to draw people to worldly practices. Remember John said, if you love the world, you love the Father, it is not you. And if we are born of God, we, we should not allow ourselves to be governed by the, by the practices and the culture of the world. So, so, so we know for sure, according to how we live our lives, where our allegiance lies. Now, if we are looking for a physical mark, remember, you well, we rightfully said it's appropriate. And I believe those are symbolic. The forward and the head, the forward, the forward and the hands. The, the hands represent your work, your actions. The head represents your thought patterns, your belief systems. So your, your thought patterns, your belief system, and your actions dictate to which system you belong to. The Bible says if you yield your members as instruments of righteousness, you belong to that system. If you yield your members as instruments of righteousness, you belong to God. So your hands are your instruments of righteousness. Your head, your 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 forward your represents your thoughts, what goes on in your in your mind, your belief systems, what you believe, but I didn't for you whether or not you have the mark or not. So in a spiritual sense, yes, you can know. If we are looking for a physical identification, I don't think it is going to come that way. Honestly speaking, I think that this is a figurative expression. Remember, the book of Revelation is very very symbolic. It, it has a lot of spiritual applications. I think that a lot of what we interpret by revelation, we should interpret it in that light. And, and that's why I'm not inclined to be looking for any physical mark that we will carry on our forehead or, or, or on our hands to identify us with this system we belong to. It, it can be easily identified by what you practice and what you believe. Spiritually speaking, I think it's going to come down to that. What you believe and what you practice. That's it. All right, I hope that that, that gives you a, a better understanding. Um, they said we, we are going to try as much as possible to, to see the spiritual implications because that's very much what we need to understand and that we don't get too carried away with the symbol, but with the meaning and the application. Because back to Annie Farm again, you can easily get carried away with the animals and love the story of the animals. And but it, it, 
is, is has a purpose for us to understand what was being taught. And so when we try to apply the symbols and what it represents and whatnot, there's a spiritual application that is deep that God wants us to get and wants us to be able to understand. So that's what we are going to try to aim at as we even look at the world passages from Revelation. Okay, it seems like that's the final question. So I'm looking forward to next week and, and join us. Don't miss it. It's going to be really, really interesting. I think your eyes are going to be open to some things perhaps that you may not have been given thought to. Um, and that's what we're going to be looking at next week. The, the, the whole presence of pagan practices within the church and where they came from, the origin of them, and you know how we should view them. Not trying to control what, what people are associated with or aligned with, but just trying to show you um, how these things are identified um, within the church. So I show you a few of them tonight, but there are more that we will we'll have to look at next week. Thank you. <laughs>